Good morning, everyone. I'd like to invite you to come on in and uh, have a seat. I know we're a minute or two early, but we want to give our vision speaker plenty of time to uh, inform us this morning. So we're going to start with things just a moment early. Okay, so to begin with this morning, um, at 5.30 we had our annual fun run, and those who didn't join us missed beautiful Venus in the morning sky and the geckos screaming at us from all the trees. So um, all those who participated this morning, can I have you stand up? Come on, Sam, give these folks a round of applause. I'm, uh, I'm unable to uh, pick out which one was the winner as they were all sprinting so fast. And it also helped that we had a 530 group and a 545 group. So you can ask me about that later. All right. One other recognition we want to uh, do this morning um, is we want to recognize the people that have uh, put together this wonderful uh, program and, and conference. So when I read your names, if you could just stand up so people could uh, recognize you from the conference planning committee. If we could have Marcella Lesher, Lisa Mar Martinchik, Trina Nolan, Sarah Perlmutter, Lydia Pyburn, Micheline Westfall, Allison Zellner, if you could all stand up. Let's give these folks a round of applause. I'm just the talking head. Those are the folks who put together this wonderful conference. And of course, my co-chair, who did tons of work, um, Janice Lindquist. I said Janice. <laughs> Poor Janice had to deal with me constantly calling her Joyce. It was quite the, the burden. Um, and then from the Program Planning Committee, and when I read your name, if you could stand up. Chair Kelly Getz, Vice Chair Anna Creech, members Michael Arthur, Morag Boyd, Patrick Carr, Karen Davidson, Kitty Henderson, Violetta Illick, I'm sorry, Violetta, I'm sorry. Uh, Mary Ann Jones, Mike Markwith, Buddy Pennington, Diana Reed, and Wendy Robertson. Let's give those a round of applause, too. Thank you to all the work you've been doing for the past few months. All right. Okay, some items of business. For today's uh, informal discussion groups, um, the actual locations did not print off on your schedules, so we are going to be posting them on the, the pegboard out across from the registration desk. So please take a minute today to go and look where the rooms are um, for the informal discussion groups at, groups at lunch. Also, pertaining to lunch, um, there's been a little confusion about the box lunches, so uh, I wanted to explain that, and I need to thank Susan Davis who's dropped her ticket that you must have in order to get a box lunch so I can use it as an example. Thank you, Susan. Um, if you, you should have got one of these in your packet if you purchased a box lunch. If you do not have one of these tickets, there's not a box lunch for you and you'll need to, to go out and, and purchase one outside the hotel. Um, if you think you bought one and it was not in your packet, Please see us at the registration desk and we'll see uh, how our records work out, okay? So, so again, um, because of the logistics of the hotel, we ask you to sign up for this on the registration. And if you did not and did not get a ticket, then unfortunately there's not a lunch for you and you'll need to, uh, to, to get something, which you can bring back in and, and bring back up to a discussion group. That is okay. So <clears throat> that is lunches. Some of you may have seen this uh, at the registration desk. This is the memorial book for, uh, for Birdie. We really need more of us to come by and, and sign this. And even if you didn't know her well, please come and, and just write a few thoughts. Um, someone is going to be attending her memorial tomorrow and we want to send this with them and would like to have all the, our thoughts for her because she did so much for our organization. So if this is sitting at the registration desk, please find some time to come and uh, sign that. Um, the evaluations committee asked me to mention that you will be receiving an email 
uh, with an evaluation, please fill it out. We really do read those comments and use them to improve the conference uh, in, in successive years. Okay. A um, couple more notes. On the message board, there's quite a few messages for rides, people offering rides to the airport tomorrow. Um, if you're in need of a ride or wanting to carpool, please take a look there to see if, if uh, you can give or, or, or are able to sign up to, to get a ride there to help people. You will also see another group of people, or Steve Kelly. Steve, can you stand up for a second and show off the lovely button on your, on your chest? I don't, I don't have the button. Oh, you don't have one. Eleanor. Eleanor. Eleanor, can you stand up? Thank you so much. Look for folks today with this lovely yellow button. Thank you. <laughs> These are folks who are beginning to plan the 30th anniversary, which is our, our next year's conference. And they're wanting to have discussion about ideas and things that they can do to uh, help make our 30th anniversary celebration a lot of fun. So if you have some ideas or thoughts, see Eleanor or other people with these lovely yellow buttons. Um, a little, uh, one other logistical thing, this evening, this room and, and all the ballrooms along this level. So this one, C where you ate breakfast or D where you ate breakfast. The hotel has assigned it out to another group. So just know that um, this evening there's going to be traffic here that's not going to be us. Um, and, so, and so just realize there'll be that traffic. One thing that you'll see with that is the registration desk at three o'clock will be moving from where it is to the east promenade, which is right uh, at the uh, elevators on the other side of this, this promenade area. So if you come looking this evening for information from us, we're going to be over there. And also the, the Convention Bureau, who's put a desk with lots of information to help you find something to do this evening in this free night, will also be moving over there at 3 o'clock. And um, great folks from the Convention Bureau, they know a lot about the city, so if you have any questions about something to do around town this evening, uh, take advantage of them, because they really do know what they're talking about. Um, and I believe those are all the items of business that I have at this time, so I will turn the, the mic over to Bob Boise. All right, so as your, uh, as your past president for just one more day, I decided to take a liberty and introduce a new element to our, uh, our little conference. And, the element that I want to introduce, uh, and I hope it's carried on in the future, is conference themes that did not make the cut. <laughs> uh, yeah. So the first one was eliminated because it was considered kind of a tongue twister. That was uh, wranglin' and wrestling re-resources. <laughs> another one was uh, cute, but not so cute. Uh, little periodicals on the prairie. <laughs> There was uh, some people advocating for the Magnificent Seven of metadata. Um, uh, some of our vendors went with High Plains Licensor. Um, the next one was uh, High Stakes Cereals with steak spelled like the meat. Yeah. But the one that I liked but, of course, didn't make the cut was Cereal Stampede. OK. All right. That's enough fun. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I hope uh, that you'll, um, you'll enjoy, like I know I will, this, this next uh, vision speaker. Herbert von de Sample is uh, going to talk to us uh, on the topic of from a system of journals to a web of objects. I want to tell you a little bit about Herbert's background. Uh, Herbert von de Sample graduated in mathematics and computer science at Ghent University, Belgium and in 2000 obtained a PhD in com communication science there. For many years he headed uh, library automation at Ghent University. After leaving Ghent in 2000 he was visiting professor in computer science at Cornell University and director of e-strategy and programs at the British Library. Currently he's team leader of the prototyping team at the research library of the Los Alamos National Laboratory. The team does research regarding various aspects of scholarly communication in the digital age including information infrastructure, interoperability, digital preservation, and indicators for the assessment of the quality of units of scholarly communication. Herbert has played a major role in creating the Open Archives Initiative Protocol for Metadata Harvesting, OAIPMH, the Open Archives Initiative Object Reuse and Exchange Specifications, OAIORE, 
the open URL framework for context sensitive services, the SFX linking server, the BX scholarly recommender service, and info URI. Quite, a, quite an impressive list. Currently he works with his team on the hyperlink and Memento, which is time travel for the web, open annotation, and resource sync projects. More information is available on Herbert's homepage. Um, if you go to public.lanl, that's Los Alamos' um, uh, acronym, uh, public.lanl.gov slash Herbert V. And I um, hope you, uh, Nasig, will give Herbert a warm welcome. Thanks a lot for uh, that introduction, and thanks a lot to Nasik for um, inviting me. There's a little piece of bio that's not on my website, but that I would like to share. So I was indeed uh, head of library automation uh, at Ghent University for about 17 years. And when I started as a really young fellow, the first thing I did was uh, connect with the Dovis Libis Consortium of uh, the University of Louvain. Uh, we didn't have any catalog automation at Ghent University at that time. So I thought rather than start something from scratch, uh, there's something wrong with the audio here. <coughs> I'm going to make a joke, so I'd rather have a <laughs> <laughs> Just tell me when I'm okay. It would be the position of your mic. Yeah. No, I don't think so. Oh, here, here we are. <laughs> No, it's pretty good, actually. <laughs> All right, so what was I saying again? Yes, library automation at Ghent University, the Dovis Levis Network, uh, and so on. So the very first thing we did, actually, we started with serious cataloging. And for a year, I personally took part of a shift that was all about cataloging the entire holdings of Ghent University in the Dovis Liebe system. So I did some serious cataloging in the past. <laughs> A lot has changed uh, since then. And as you just heard, um, for about, um, well, more than 10 years actually, I've been at the lab in Los Alamos in the research library. And I lead a small uh, research uh, team there. And our topic's really uh, scholarly communication in the digital age. And so everything we do is really about uh, the transition of the scholarly communication system from an entirely paper-based system to a system where basically we took the paper-based one and we digitized it and put it on the web towards what I like to call the web of objects, a truly natively digital and network scholarly communication system that really embraces the web and all its aspects. The document web, the social web, the semantic web. And where scholarly communication, the scholarly process, and the scholarly actors themselves truly live on the web. And so we are doing research about you know, that kind of transition and what it uh, all means. And it's actually a rather painful uh, transition. A couple of examples of things that I've worked on uh, in the past uh, 10 or so years. <clears throat> uh, when Johan Bollen was still on my team, we did uh, the Measure project. And Measure was all about the consideration that when you're in a networked environment, one can start to obtain way more metrics than uh, about impact and about performance of scholars than we were able to do in a paper-based system. So we used to have the impact factor for journals, obviously. Once you're in a network environment, you can derive all kind of other things. And Measure looked at download information and collected massive amounts of download information from publishers around the world and tried to figure out, is there structure in that information? And if so, can metrics be derived from that? And the answer was uh, positive, obviously. And it is fair to say that this work inspired uh, and was a big catalyst for what is now known as the altmetrics uh, movement. This is also the work that uh, led to the BX recommender service that some of you uh, may know, which is actually marketed by Ex Libris. And this is not a promotion for Ex Libris, this is just, this was my work. Then uh, Memento 
is about time travel uh, for the web. And what Memento really is, it is an extension of the HTTP protocol that makes the web tick. And the extension allows you to talk to a resource on the web and basically say, I'm not interested in what you look like today. I'm interested in what you looked like X months ago or X years ago. Show me that. And so the protocol will automatically bring you to old versions of those pages in case they exist. They can exist in web archives or they can exist in content management systems such as wikis. So that's uh, the Memento protocol. Hyperlink, I'm not going to go into detail now because I'll talk quite a bit about that later, but this is basically about the whole notion of time travel, but applied to scholarly communication. And then there's ResourceSync, um, a project that just ended up uh, as an ANSI standard uh, last week or so. This is the problem domain of the protocol for metadata harvesting, so it's about moving information from location A to location B on the web. But when the protocol for metadata harvesting was obviously about metadata, this is about web resources in general. And how, in a web-based manner, can we move collections of information from a location to uh, another location? And again, this just uh, became a standard uh, last year. Anyhow, the common denominator in all of this, as I mentioned, is using the web to address scholarly communication issues. And by the web, I mean the document web, the social web, and the semantic web, or uh, linked data web. Most of the work I do is technical, so this talk will be slightly technical, way more technical than yesterday's, uh, although there will be quite some overlap in topics uh, with what Catherine uh, was talking about yesterday. So my work is mainly about interoperability across scholarly systems, across scholarly information, and always from the perspective of achieving interoperability by working with the web and with web standards and web technologies. The other thing is that most of my work, and that's the not sexy bit of it, is targeted at machines. It's not because I don't like people, but it's because when you increase accessibility for machines, you can actually create way better tools for humans. So, one could look at the work that I'm doing from the perspective of a scholarly communication system and the core functions that it fulfills. Most, some of you may be familiar with the work of Rosendahl and Goers that characterize a scholarly communication system as follows. There's the notion of registering a finding, certifying a finding, that's like peer review for example, awareness being able to discover uh, new uh, scientific findings, archiving them, and that will really be uh, the core of my talk today, making sure that in the long term we still have access to the scholarly record, and then rewarding people on the basis of their performance uh, in the system. And so all of these projects, as I mentioned earlier, they all you know, relate to some of these core functions uh, of scholarly communication. As depicted here, measure is about rewarding, it's about metrics, right? Memento and Hyperlink are about archiving, and resourcing is about moving stuff from one place uh, to another. So the context of my entire talk will be this transition from a paper-based system to a truly native web-based scholarly communication system. And I'm going to focus on one aspect of that transition, and it's about the long-term access to the scholarly record. The way we are evolving, becoming totally digital, totally web-based, will we be able to revisit the scholarly record in the future like we used to be able to do in a paper-based system? That's really uh, the problem domain that I'm going to explore. Now, first of all, as I said, this talk is going to be a tiny bit technical, and I don't know how technical or non-technical this audience is. So I don't want to insult anyone, but I'm going to use the term HTTP URI very often, or URI, that stands for Uniform Resource Identifier, and it's the web address of something, okay? It's the address of resource. So no, no insult here. Just want to make sure that I don't talk for an hour, and then you step out of here, and what was this URI thing he was talking about? <laughs> okay, 
So this is URI, and you will hear a lot about URIs. Okay, here we go. So I'm going to start the journey in the paper-based uh, system. <clears throat> and here's the situation. So at a certain moment in time, <clears throat> a new journal article is being published in the journal, obviously. This is paper. And this article references several other publications. Right? And the situation in the paper-based system is such that libraries around the world have holdings of uh, these journals and actually archive them for the long term. The net result of all of that is that when I revisit years after the publication of that article, that environment, I can easily pull that publication back up from a shelf of the library, but not only that publication, I can actually pull back the entire context surrounding it, meaning all the articles that are being referenced I can also pull together. It may mean that I have to travel from one library to another to do so because my own library doesn't have it all, but the point is here, if I take a train, a bus, or maybe even a flight, I can actually completely reconstruct that original publication context consisting of the article and the referenced articles years down after uh, the publication of the original article. Let's see what the situation is in the system that we live in now. And I'm actually going to look at two incarnations of the current system. <clears throat> so, the first is again, we have this publication, but now it's you know, on the web, it's a PDF or an HTML, uh, and now it doesn't really only reference other papers, it actually links to other papers. There's actional kind of, uh, actionable things that are there. So I'm not going to have to travel, you know, take a plane or train to go revisit that referenced article. I'm actually going to click that link, right? The other thing is that with the emergence of digital scholarly communication, suddenly libraries got out of the picture of archiving those materials, or at least for quite a while, it was uncertain who was going to do the archiving. And as uh, Catherine mentioned yesterday, special purpose organizations emerged, like LOX and Portico, the e-depot in the Netherlands, that were going to take care of the archiving uh, of those materials. So, in this kind of environment, can we actually, just like we were able to, in the paper-based context, revisit that entire publication context a couple of years after the article was published, is the question. Well, let's look at that. First of all, as I said, we're going to now have to follow links to get to that information. Now, links, as we know, on the web are brittle. They break. You all know the 404, which I actually will talk quite a bit about uh, uh, later also. Article to article links are brittle for a very special reason we have acquisitions and mergers of publishers. And that means that the URIs of these articles change over time. And hence, we've invented solutions to prevent that from breaking the scholarly record. And the solution is persistent identifiers, such as digital object identifiers. And rather than linking directly from an article to another article, we link by means of DOIs that are an intermediate, where we manage you know, the location of the eventual article. And that makes sure that these links keep on working uh, over time. Around the DOIs, Crossref specifically has built a very successful infrastructure that provides some interoperable glue you know, for the scholarly communication system uh, that we know now. But it's not all rosy, as a matter of fact, because the entire system currently is totally geared towards humans. If you're a machine in this kind of environment, you're actually quite out of luck. Let's just presume that you're a crawler and you want to crawl because you want to archive those referenced articles, right? I mean, it's fair that you would like to crawl the web and you know, grab scholarly communication stuff and put them in an archive. Well, actually, it's not all that easy. Uh, 
So we have the URI there the, you know, that carries the DOI. What we know is that when you follow that URI, you end up at this splash page, right, that describes the article and so on. So you have a piece of HTML there. And now, on that splash page, there's like a million links, right? There's links all over the place, and a human is obviously able to interpret where these links go. You know, it says, well, look up citations of this thing, or download bibliographic records here, and stuff like that. And one of these links is the link to the actual article. And we as humans can see that. A machine has no freaking clue, right? <laughs> <laughs> a machine sees a million of links and now tries to figure out, oh, so where should I go now to get that thing and archive it? Well, there's no way, all right? So what we need here is a splash page for that is machine readable, that is machine actionable. A splash page that says, well, I actually have a splash page and if you're interested in my real content, it's over there. And if you're interested in content related to the article, well, that's actually there. This is a video related to it. Here's an image, et cetera, et cetera. And we need to express that in ways that machines uh, can understand it. That was about the links. The good news was we have been able for scholarly communication to make persistent links that will lead to stuff. The bad news was that the infrastructure when it comes to links is really not geared towards machines. Now the other thing, remember we had archives of uh, journals, you know, in the paper-based world. But so how are we doing when it comes to the digital? Because the articles currently they all lead to operational systems on the web. Right? They lead to the portals of big publishers. But what if some of these operational systems go out of business, cease operation? Well, that's when we're going to have to rely on those archives. Right? So these archives somehow have to exist. And again, um, Catherine yesterday referred to the fact that we're actually not doing all that great with that respect. And that very optimistic estimates are that only about 50%, that's very optimistic actually, of the journal literature, the digital journal literature, is archived in one of these special purpose archives. And as David Rosenthal in this blog describes, what we archive is actually the stuff that's not even endangered because it's material by really big publishers like Elsevier, Springer and so on, but they're not going to cease operation on the live web. They're not really endangered. And on the other hand, it's the easy stuff. It's the materials that are of a format that is very easy to preserve digitally, very easy to grab from the web, and so on. And it's actually the harder material that is at risk of um, getting lost that we're not archiving. So we're not doing all that great here. And the real issue here is that we don't really even have measurements about how well we are doing. There's the Keepers Registry that is operated by my dear friend Peter Burnell at Edina at the University uh, of Edinburgh that tries to create this registry of all the materials, the journal literature that is uh, digitally archived. First of all, this is work in progress, so it's not complete. It contains information about quite a few of these special purpose archives, but not all of them at all. But here's my major beef with this. This is totally journal-centric. This lives in the past. And why do I say that? It is based on journals. It's based on ISSN numbers, based on notions like volume and issue that have no place in the web world. In the web world, we work with URIs and with DOIs. And so this is a registry that will tell you that this certain organization holds these years or these volumes or issues of a certain, uh, of a certain journal. What I want to know is when I look at an electronic article and I see a couple of links to other articles, I want to be able to say, hey, this thing here, with this DOI, is that actually archived somewhere? I want to be able to audit on the basis of the currency by which this thing is really known on the web, which is its URI, which is its DOI. By the way, 
We can do this for regular resources on the web, but we can't for the journal literature. How can we do it? Well, here, take the URI of David Rosenthal's blog, go to the Internet Archive, look it up, and you'll find indeed that there's an archived copy of it. Even better than that, with the Memento infrastructure, of which you see a little screenshot here, we can do this across all the open web archives of the world. I can basically say, this URI here, which archives do have a version of this thing, and when did they actually archive it? And we find here that for David Rosenthal's blog, there's only one copy, and it's in the Internet Archive. But for the NASIC site, I actually find 429 archived copies in the Internet Archive and in another archive that is called archive.is. So this is stuff I can just do on the open web. I cannot do this for the journal literature. So can we revisit the original publication context for this incarnation of the journal system on the web? Actually, the answer is that we don't even know. And that the answer most likely is, well, no, we can't. If some of these live operations cease to exist, we may very well find that there's no way to get into archives that actually hold archived content. There may just not be archived content at all. Now I'm going to go to the second incarnation of this system. And you'll see that the news gets worse and worse, obviously, right? <laughs> That's why I'm here to bring you really bad news. <laughs> so here's the situation. So again, we have this publication, right? It's a digital publication. It lives on the web. It links, references, links to some other publications, but suddenly, it starts to link to other stuff. And what is that other stuff? Well, I'm going to call it web at large resources. And they are resources that are needed or created in research activities. They can be project websites, software, ontologies, workflows, online debate, slides, blogs, videos, what have you. All the stuff that researchers create as they go about uh, their business. And there's a slight problem with these kind of resources. They live on the web, and hence, they are dynamic, they change over time, and they're ephemeral. They may just uh, disappear. And so the situation that we're facing is going back to, can we actually revisit the original context? Well, it's becoming extremely hard, right? Because now, well, that publication hopefully still exists, yeah, on the live web or in an archive. The linked publications we talked about earlier, hopefully they are somewhere. But what about that software that was linked? Well, that software changes, and the software on which that software depends, that sits underneath it, that changes. There's a data set maybe, or a blog, or a video, or what have you not. Well, maybe that just disappears, okay? And this problem domain is at the core of the hyperlink uh, project. There's something that fundamentally distinguishes these kind of resources that I talk about with the journal literature uh, kind of resources. Because these kind of things are not necessarily under custodianship of people, parties that even care about the long term. Right? One can expect that Journal publishers hopefully care at least to some extent about long term and the future and so on. But these parties in many cases don't. You know, they have a project website, they do their project, project done, website gone, right? So this is the kind of stuff uh, that we're talking about. Also, these kind of resources have not, don't, do not have the same sense of fixity like journal articles do. They change. What is at that certain link to your ride today? Is something else tomorrow, something else in a year from now, and so on and so on. So the problem that we are researching in Hyperlink, we started to call reference rod. <coughs> I know, pretty cool. <coughs> Link rod, you probably know. 
Link crop is a term that is very frequently used on the web, and it refers to links that stop to work. So you get 404 not found, these kind of irritating messages. That's a special case of the problem that we're talking about with reference rot. There's another component to the reference rot problem, and it's content drift. And it's that entire notion that when I write a paper and I link to a certain resource on the web by means of its URI, I saw certain content that I wanted to link to. Three years down the road, that content may completely have changed and may be totally non-representative of what I initially really meant to link to. And that's what we call content drift. So you revisit that environment a couple of years, sometimes even a couple of days after you put the link in place and the content has already dramatically changed. So basically, your reference, your link is worth nothing anymore. So in the research component of Hyperlink, which by the way is funded by the Mellon Foundation, we take large corpora of scientific uh, information. I'm going to talk about the PubMed corpus uh, in these slides here, but we also take Elsevier, the physics archive, sites here, and so on and so on. And what we do is, uh, and we take a corpus basically from 1997, that's when links started to appear in journal articles until uh, about 2012. And what we do is, look, we take all of these articles, we parse them all, and we extract the URIs that we find in these articles. When I say we, that's obviously machines doing this, right? I, I hope you got that. <laughs> We're talking about millions and millions uh, of articles here. Then we look at those URIs. And the ones that link to the journal system, we exclude because we pretend that they're okay. They are archived. I just said they were not, but still. <laughs> We're not looking at those. So what we look at are only those kind of links that, put, that you know, go to the web at large kind of resources. Yeah. So the things that we really think uh, are endangered. So this first thing here, this is for an upcoming paper uh, that I'm writing with my team, is that this is actually a significant thing. It's not like you know, an exotic little thing that here and there, there's a paper that links to the web. This shows you that there's a dramatic increase in the amount of references to the web at large going from almost nothing in 1997 to way over 100,000 in 2012 in the PubMed uh, corpus. Okay. Now here we start looking at the link rot problem. And this is a, bit, a tiny bit a complicated uh, plot. But let's start with uh, the y-axis uh, here. So on the x-axis you have the time, okay, going from 97 to 2012, and here we have a percentage, okay? And this is the percentage of links that are dead, okay? So as a function of their publication here. And not surprisingly, uh, links that were put in place in 1997, 80% of them uh, are gone. If you look at 2012, about 50 to 20% of them are gone already, so two years. You look around the 2006, 2007 frame, you know, so let's say five to seven or so years, you reach 30 to 40% of links that do no longer work. This is, by the way, a pattern that has been found by other link rot studies also that work at way smaller scale than us. So we do this at a really uh, massive kind of scale, and, but we, our findings are very similar to other uh, link rot studies. Now look at the right hand uh, here, and then you see uh, the number of references, uh, really. Okay? And the blue is the total number of references, and the red are the ones uh, that are dead. So you may think, well, this is good news, right? Because, well, the, the red proportion is kind of relatively small compared to the blue. Well, let me give you a couple of insights here. So here, for example, in 2012, we have about 20,000 that are dead. But remember, with a 30% kind of decrease over a couple of years, 
right? This means that by 2017, we are talking about 60, 70,000 of those links that are going to be there. Okay. The other thing is that it's not even all that meaningful to look at whether these links still work or not work. Remember that I said that that content changes over time? So, when I parse out a URI that was linked to in 2005, and I check it today, and I see that it still works, well, congratulations to the website manager. That's fantastic that you have kept that URI going. But the point is that that content is no longer representative of what I really link to, because obviously it has changed in these couple of years. Okay. So it means that even though you could think, well, oh, link rot, it's kind of still good, these blue ones, these good ones, still really don't account to anything. So the question now becomes, so where could we find things, pages, that are representative of what indeed was linked to? Well, the, ob the obvious answer is in web archives, right? Because web archives crawl the web, they archive web resources, and so if I would like to find back a referenced resource as it was around the time that it was referenced, I need to go look in web archives. And that's what we do as another component of hyperlink. We basically use the Memento infrastructure again, and we use it now to figure out whether there's any of the web archives around the world that contain an archived version of a linked resource from around the time, around the time that it was actually linked to. And now the news becomes really dramatic. So what you see here, the first bit here is basically what you saw earlier. All the links from the PubMed corpus, the ones that are still operational here, and the ones that are dead here. But now, what you see down here is the ones of all of these that are archived and the ones that are not archived. And by archived, in this case, I mean there exists a snapshot of a linked resource in a web archive in a time frame of about a month around the original link. Okay? So the article was published, the link was put in place, a month around that time. Is there something in a web archive or not? And now you suddenly see a rather dramatic picture where it is about 80%, for about 80% of the stuff that we link to, we have no archived copies. Okay. I'm going to skip this one. Uh, basically what we did there is an extrapolation uh, based on the sample that we had and based on the understanding how big the STM corpus is. We figured out how much articles have the reference rot disease, and it's really in the millions when you look at the time frame 1997 uh, to 2012. So the answer here is obvious. Can we create the original context? Well, we can't at all, and we really need to do something about that. So first of all, there's a lack of archived resources. We need to do something about that. And there's something really interesting to be said about how we link to archived resources also. Maybe I'll get to that. It will depend uh, on time, actually. Let me mention that our, uh, the information I showed you earlier there is all about STM literature and reference rot uh, there. This is not restricted at all to STM. Recently, there was an article in the New York Times, actually, uh, based on a study done by Jonathan Zittrain at Harvard University, and they looked at uh, the legal literature, so law journals, and they looked at Supreme Court decisions, uh, both of which actually contain links to the web uh, at large, and in all cases they find dramatic uh, percentages of link and reference fraud. The problem also exists uh, outside of scholarly communication, there's a big thread on uh, Wikipedia about link rot. Obviously, Wikipedia links to resources in the web at large, and the problems I just described exist uh, there also. What that really means is that it is 
a web at large problem that scholarly communication also suffers from. And because it is a web at large problem, it needs to be solved in the web, okay? And hence, this brings us again to web archiving. And over the past 10 or so years, a rather small group of institutions around the world have developed very significant uh, tools to help you uh, in web archiving. And this is really the paradigm that we should follow to archive those kind of resources uh, that I've been talking about. We need to do better than web archiving, however. Web archiving currently follows a crawler-based paradigm. So basically, the web archives send out robots on the web and they gather you know, web resources, stuff them into their archives. Because of the way this is done and the frequency at which it's done, one starts to get what we call temporally inconsistent archived resources. You all know that web pages are not just HTML, but there's embedded stuff in there and linked stuff and all that, right? Well, the way these crawlers work is that they'll grab the HTML today and the embedded stuff tomorrow and the other embedded stuff in a week from now and six weeks from now and so on and so on. And that means that sometimes you get weird stuff like this. And this is um, clearly, this is a weather report, and it's a weather report for some city in uh, Utah for December 9, 2004. And you see the temporal drift here. The page is made up of HTML that is exactly of that date, December 9, 2004, I said. But then these other components do not match. You have the satellite image here that's nine months younger. You have this here. Nine hours time difference, 20 days, 17 days, and so on and so on. Now, again, going back to our perspective or our problem of recreating the scholarly record as it was at a certain point, this is not good enough. We need this to be accurate. We need this to be temporally consistent. And so we need to really do more in web archiving. And there's really two components uh, to all of that. First of all, and I'm talking to librarians here, increase web archiving efforts with scholarly focus. Focus crawls that go to stuff that are highly likely to be referenced uh, in scholarly communication. Start with your own institutional web pages. I find it fascinating that there's so few libraries around the world that even archived their own institutional presence on the web. Funded projects I talked about, research projects, you know, they set up this website, Project Gone, you know, et cetera. Go archive these things. Make sure they're preserved because they will be linked to rather frequently. There's tools available for that. There's on-demand subscription, uh, uh, based services like archive.it, and my team actually developed a piece of software that self-archives a web server as it operates. I'm not going to go into the dec technical details, but this took more than a year of development time of someone on my team, and I thought people were going to start using it like crazy, people like libraries, you know, and all that. Hardly any downloads have we seen for this thing. And it's not because it's bad software. It's just because somehow people don't seem to understand that stuff really needs to be archived. That's one side of the medal. The other is that in the course of the life cycle of an article, as it is being produced and it finds its way onto the web, we have several intervention points where we can start archiving referenced resources, okay? So for example, as an author is writing an article or even is doing its note-taking, the author could start to proactively archive resources. There's a lot of web servers out there, I mean uh, archives out there that will accept your URI and then they will go grab the URI and put it in their archive. In, as part of the hyperlink experiment or a project, we've done this experiment with the Sotero extension. So 
as an author visits a website, the author can bookmark it in Zotero, but as soon as that is done, a copy of that page is also being pushed into a web archive. And that's done fully automatically uh, with this extension. PermaCC, exemplary. This started at Harvard University in the law library. And this is a consortium of libraries worldwide now that set up a web archive in the consortium aimed at tackling reference fraud for the legal literature. So here, scholars that publish in legal journals can go when they want to reference a website in their papers, they can go to this web archive, enter the URI of the page they want to reference, and then get it archived. And in return, they will get the URI of the archived material back and put that uh, in their paper as a reference. We are currently working with my team on a tool that will basically intervene in the manuscript submission or repository submission. So basically, as a new paper is being submitted into a system, a third party is being informed that this happened. That party collects the paper, extracts the URIs, pushes everything into a web archive. I had a lot of slides to demonstrate that, but I see that you're falling asleep. <laughs> The neat bit about all of this is that once these things are in web archives around the world with the memento infrastructure that I've described shortly, you can basically go from that reference to your eye in this paper to the web archive without actually even knowing what the URI of that thing in the web archive is. It is enough to know this URI here and a timestamp of submission into the repository and automatically the infrastructure will bring you to an appropriate temporal copy snapshot of that reference thing in the web archive. Obviously it needs to exist, so obviously it needs to be proactively created. Little plug for Memento. By the way, who had heard about Memento before? Ooh, that's dramatic. <laughs> so we're going to change this. <laughs> to keep it very simple, this is what Memento does for you. This is today's, actually it was yesterday's, NASIC homepage. This works with the browser plugin. There's this pop-down here that shows a calendar, and I'm selecting a date in the past. And in this case, I select May 17, 2001. And then behind the scenes, the Memento protocol does its work, and one ends up May 19, 2001. Not good enough? Well, I'm sorry, it's two days off. I understand, <laughs> but you know, there doesn't seem to be a copy available for May 17, so a little bit out of luck. Now let's just take one moment to admire this page. <laughs> Anyhow, this plugin, Memento, for Chrome is downloadable. I need to see, I know exactly how many copies were downloaded until yesterday. If I don't see another two, three hundred downloaded, <laughs> I'm never coming to another NASIC conference. <laughs> okay? It's really, it's really very cool. And you can not only do this for pages as such, you can follow every link in time by right-clicking it and selecting uh, a time. Okay, it's, it's actually really cool. If you don't want to install it, there's actually two uh, YouTube videos under my account, that's HVD Somp YouTube, that demonstrate uh, how it works. So maybe before you install, you look at this, I'm sure you're going to be convinced. Okay. So no, we cannot uh, recreate that context uh, at all in the current environment. I think I've made that clear. And I would like to ask how much time I have left. So it is now 10 of, yeah. yeah, okay. 
then I'm going to actually say something about the next thing also. I was going to skip it because it's a bit technical, but I'm going to hurt you guys. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is about linking to archived resources. And this is actually a really weird one because until halfway the hyperlink project, I had never even thought about this problem. So it must be really an interesting one. So remember I described to you this Perma CC service where basically what you do is, you know, an author visits a website, the website has a URI, you now go to Perma CC or whichever other on-demand web archive, you put that URI in and you request it to be archived. And as a result of that, you get the URI of the archive snapshot back from the archive. So typically what is being done is you take that URI of that archived copy and that's what you're going to link to now. It kind of totally makes sense, right? Because yeah, it's in an archive. That's actually really bad. First of all, the original URI of that thing is the currency on the web for that resource. It is how it is known in the web at large, but also in all the other web archives around the world, okay? You can search every web archive around the world with the original URI of a resource. So, when we take away the original URI and we replace it by the URI of the archived copy in this one archive, I've suddenly taken away all possibilities to refine that resource in another archive. That basically means that I'm now fully dependent on the permanent existence of that one archive in order to access that snapshot. Well, we all know that's not going to happen, right? It's not like web archives are forever. Nothing is, right? So really what we did, and this was really an insight for me when I did this work, we really replaced one link rot problem with another. Okay? Just if you want examples that web archives are not forever or that there's real problems here, maybe you've heard of websitation.org. It was actually the very first to offer services for scholarly communication to proactively archive websites as they are being referenced. Last year, this is taken from uh, the Internet Archive, Last year they were in massive financial problems and announced that if we cannot raise this amount of money by the end of 2013, we have to stop our activities. Here's another one, mummify.it. <laughs> Make a permanent copy of anything online for free. So, a web archive. Commercial, by the way, there was a subscription service uh, behind it. It has existed for a couple of months, and now the only available trace of mummify.it is in the Internet Archive. <laughs> and then there's this one, a really great web archive, by the way, which used to be known as archive.is, until two or so weeks ago, where the service that manages the .is domains got under attack and, you know, could really have been jeopardized. And immediately, the guy in charge of this archive renamed the archive from archive.is to archive.today. That means that all the links that we would have put in place to archive.is, blah, 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 would have been dead today. All right. so, Archives are not forever. Those kind of new links into archives, they are not really trustworthy. It's a very interesting problem domain. And I'm now working with people at Harvard, uh, both the, the law library, so the Perma CC people, the Berkman Center, and my colleague Michael Nelson at Old Dominion University to try and really standardize another way to link to archived resources by maintaining their original URIs and by augmenting the links with attributes that provide temporal information, such as what was the date that you were visiting this, 
because that I could then use with Memento to travel into a web archive, or what is the URI of a thing in a web archive, and so on and so on. This is ongoing work. We really only just started, and we started to become known as the 404 No More collaboration, and that's because someone in the Daily Dot uh, wrote about uh, this effort. I didn't invent this name. Okay, I'm going to skip this one. So, we've looked at the paper-based system, and I think I've shown you that no problem there in recreating the entire publication context. We've looked at the current journal system as it exists on the web, actually two incarnations, and problems with both, actually, and the problems get more severe in the second incarnation of the journal system on the web uh, than in the first. And that's only a little sign of the problems that are to come. Once we move to the future scholarly communication system, which I started to refer to the web of objects, that's actually where the real challenges are going to emerge. And the stuff I talked about so far, they're just the signs on the wall of uh, the problems that we're going to start facing. There's no time to characterize what this future will look like. Neither could I, actually, because I'm not a futurist. But I'm going to show three characterizations that are relevant for this kind of discussion here about recreating the scholarly uh, context you know, in the future. Three characteristics that I'm going to illustrate with a couple of very small examples, basically showing that the future is already here. First characteristic, the research process, not just its outcome, is becoming visible on the web. Second, there's an increased use of common web platforms for scholarship. The communicated objects are very, very different than the ones that we are used to. They're heterogeneous, dynamic, compound, interrelated, and they all natively live on the web. Examples. Obvious one, data, research data. I mean, I can't go to a single meeting anymore or it's all about research data. And it's actually really fascinating how fast this has happened. In the time frame of, let's say, five or so years, we went from not even talking about data to now it's all about data. And clearly, data had become part, an integral part, of the web-based scholarly communication record. There's a lot of activity going on currently about looking at software as scholarly objects. In certain disciplines, you know, software is auxiliary information. In others, it is core. And researchers that create such software want to be recognized as a software contribution. They want to be able to cite it. This is stuff that needs to be archived if it's going to be part of the scholarly record. Why stop there? I don't write software. In a long time, actually, I haven't written software. But I do a lot of presentations in order to increase their visibility. I put them on, YouTube, uh, on uh, SlideShare, in this case. And actually, I get an awful lot of views there. I consider this part of my scholarly output. Some of these things get actually 10,000 views. So why would that not be part of the scholarly record of the future? Wikis are increasingly used for science, for scholarship. This example here is Wiki Pathways. It is about biological pathways, so researchers contribute information to their wiki. Really beautiful in the sense that it has very good version management. It's based on the MediaWiki uh, software. And of course, it has the whole social interaction that you have with wikis. Another example here is for terminology in the neurosciences. Again, it's a MediaWiki platform versioning social interaction. E-lab notebooks. This relates totally to this notion of research itself you know, coming to the web. People are starting to document their experiments in lab notebooks. They're sharing them online. In the case of this one here, this is open malaria. This is totally fascinating. As the experiment happens, 
you can stay in touch. You can get notified. There's RSS feeds, there's alerts. There's a new experiment. We have a new result in the moment. My experiment, wonderful example of what is to come. This is in the bioinformatics. And this is a social portal to share workflows, scientific workflows. And those are workflows that do computations on data that is available in a variety of data centers, each with their own APIs, where the workflow software changes over time, the APIs change over time, the data evolves over time. So the entire environment is totally dynamic. And not only do we share those workflows in this environment, but also related materials. It could be a paper that results from execution of the workflow. There can be videos there. There can be PowerPoint presentation. They call it PACs. They're groups of interrelated, highly interdependent uh, objects. Just these couple of examples, I think, have illustrated those three characteristics that I wanted to bring out. Research process is visible. What that means is we have a massive extension of the scholarly record with a wide variety of new kind of objects that honestly we have no clue how to archive. Increased use of those web platforms like GitHub and SlideShare and you know, wikis and all that. Here's an interesting one. These systems look as if they are archiving because they have wonderful version management, they have really an awful lot of attractive features, but archiving they do not do, they record. It suffices to look at the terms and conditions of GitHub to see that this is not an archive. It basically explicitly says we can pull, pull the plug on you any day, any moment. Those are not archives. So if these materials, the software and all, is going to become part of the scholarly record, we need to rescue them, you know, once they've been finalized or are in a stable state, we need to rescue them in other areas. And then there's this whole notion of heterogeneous compound dynamic objects, things that belong together. This is a mind shift kind of thing. This means that one cannot archive these things like we archive journal articles or journals. Those are interrelated. They're pieces connected with other pieces and so on and so on. So this is not about, hey, let's grab this PDF file and stuff it in an archive. No, this is how is this object connected to other objects and how far do I need to go to have the entire object? This is a completely new paradigm. So can, in this environment, this future environment of the web of objects, the original context be revisited? I'm afraid I really don't have an answer at all to that. But the reason I'm doing hyperlink is to start build the perspective of the magnitude and the nature of the problem that we're facing here. And it's actually really two things that are at play here. First of all is the really fundamental question. As we evolve towards that kind of a scholarly communication system that I very briefly depicted, what is the scholarly record? Where does it start? Where does it end? If indeed the research process entirely goes to the web, which parts of that are part of the scholarly record and hence need to be archived, and which are not, and hence are okay to just get lost? How are we going to decide on that? Is this going to be related to promotion and tenure? Oh, well, these are in because you can get credit for it. Are machines going to decide on this? Is it going to be social interactions that are going to decide? Oh, this was used an awful lot, so we need to archive it. I really have no clue. And then there's the question of how will we do this? And I alluded to that in the thinking about hyperlink and proactive web archiving, but that's only one perspective of how this may have to happen in the future scholarly communication system. And with these really big questions to which I really don't have an answer, I'm going to leave it. Thank you much. <laughs> So uh, let's see if this is on.
Hello? So we have about 10 minutes uh, for questions, and I'd like you, if you can, to come up to the microphones. Uh, if you'd like to ask a question, uh, identify yourself and, and fire away. Anybody brave? <laughs> um, they're still thinking. There's a lot there. Ah, oh, Brian is coming to the rescue. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Herbert. Uh, Brian Kelly, CETUS, University of Bolton, UK. Um, a question about, has anybody done any um, analysis of the, the business model for the global network of sustainable um, archives? So I guess currently we've got things like, it's, it's the national libraries. What are the cost of, of these services on a global basis? And when we ne uh, hit the next recession, five years, 10 years, 20 years time, who's gonna fight to continue those? Yeah. So again, I really don't have an answer at all. And this is one of you know, the big problems. How are we going to do that? How are we going to do it in a sustainable way? And it's going to be really interesting, I think. This is one of the reasons I mentioned Perma CC, a consortium of libraries that steps into this problem domain. And okay, their current niche is uh, legal and things that are you know, referenced in the legal literature, but it's going to be really interesting to see how they evolve, how they set up a stable organization, because their ambition really is to persist this for decades uh, to come. So I don't know what their business model is. I know that at this point there's already more than 50 or so libraries around the world that are part of that consortium. So somehow it's going to be uh, somehow a locks, clocks uh, kind of approach, consortium approach, uh, but where the money is exactly going to come from and how they're going to sustain it, I really don't know. And it's, yes, a fundamental question in all of this. And it's going to be a question that is going to really drive how much and what and for how long we can preserve it. Mary Beth Gaudet looking for work. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, and that was a comment. That was not a question. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's my university. Uh, I, I might have to ask you to go back and explain a a little bit about PERMA CC. If, if, if I understood you correctly, um, Professor A writes an article in which he cites per, a paper by Professor B. Not, not a paper. Okay, or, a, or something by Professor B. An object no, on the web or? It, Professor A actually visits a website okay. and deems it very important to reference that website in the paper she's writing. And that website is either going to vanish or the content on that website is going to change. And hence, when Professor A puts a link in his paper to that website, that link is going to be totally useless in two years from now. And hence, what Perma CC allows Professor A to do is take the address of that website, go to the Perma CC web archive service, enter that URI, that address, in a little box, and push the button and say, archive that site for me. Okay, okay well, that answers my question, that, that I don't have a question because you clarified something. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Herbert, if I could. Um, I remember a few years back going to presentations by a guy named Brewster Kale, who was taking snapshots of the web uh, how much of the web, I don't know, seemed like every day, so that he could go back and do what you did with the NASIC website type of thing. I don't know if I hear that much about that anymore. Do you know, can you update us at all on that, what he's doing? You talk about the relevance of that stuff? Well, I, 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 thought, I thought he was taking care of it for us, you know? <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, we, we refer to this kind of reasoning to what happens when Bruce, uh, Brewster gets hit by a bus? <laughs> and this is the point I really was trying to make when I talked about even web archives are not forever. Okay, this one can truly not rely on just a single web archive to do these kind of things. One needs, for many reasons actually, a distributed and hopefully coordinated effort uh, for web archiving. There can be financial reasons, there actually can be reasons of legislature, and I'm going to give you an example why you would want to do that. A couple of months ago, 
the Conservative Party in the UK removed all of the speeches by David Cameron from its website because David Cameron had made a couple of really big promises that obviously he was not going to be able to keep. <coughs> now, obviously, that stuff sits in web archives, right? But the Conservative Party had really done its job very well. There is a policy at the Internet Archive, and I'm not going to go into technical details, that if there's a certain thing in place at the current website, then they're not allowed to show things from their web archive for that site. Okay? And so the Conservative Party dudes knew that, and they put that thing in place on their website, and hence, we were not able to see these things from the Internet Archive anymore, part of their policy. Fortunately, there were other archives around the world, and with the Memento infrastructure, in no time, we found copies, for example, in the British Library web archive. Just one example of why you really cannot rely on web one archive, by the fact that this is by far, by far, the largest web archive in the world, yes. So I'm Chris Bullock from Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville. And you spoke about research data and how there's been a big explosion of interest there. And I think a lot of that is tied to funding mandates where yes. you know, authors are required to you know, do share their data. And so I'm wondering with something like PERMA CC, how you get authors to be sort of excited about that or how you get um, you know, faculty to really be interested in preventing that reference rot. Because I'm not sure right offhand that there's a always an intrinsic motivation for that sort of thing. That's actually a, a very good question. So this is really the social component uh, of this all. And um, actually, as part of Hyperlink, we are looking a tiny bit at that. And uh, this is actually Peter Burnell, again, at uh, uh, the University of Edinburgh. He's very interested in, in this bit. And what we intend to do, so we're not working on this yet, but is to work with a group of researchers that should phenomenally care about the problem, and those are PhD students that eventually are going to have to submit their thesis, and their thesis better work. And work really means that those links better work when the committee is going to you know, look at the thesis. So, but yes, I absolutely agree that it's not because the tools are out there that the researchers will actually do it. And you know, the example I gave here with Zotero, Right. That's a very, I think it's a very interesting paradigm in the sense that where researchers typically use bibliographic management software anyhow, if somehow seamlessly, you know, that tool could take care of the web archiving, well, then you don't even need to ask anything of your researcher. You know, it just happens as the researcher uses the reference management tool. Yeah. So, we're really looking for those kind of solutions that require almost no intervention by the researcher itself. And I agree with that regard when it comes to, yeah, go visit Perma CC and do it and bring the URI back. That's going to be problematic. But the good news is the system is there, and hence APIs can be built on top of it that tools can interact with. Yeah. I'm going to allow for one more question, but we're running out of time. So go, one quick one. I'm, oh, I'm really close, okay. I'm Catherine Eastman, I'm from the Alabama College of Osteopathic Medicine, and my question's about, um, you had identified a, an issue with a web of objects in that if you archive the page, you don't archive the links that, that from that page. Are you familiar with a tool that does not only archiving of web objects, but also includes like a web crawler aspect? Sure. I mean, yeah, there's plenty, all the web, that's why I insist on web archiving as a paradigm because those tools natively do that. You know, you can typically say, uh, you know, it starts with seed kind of pages, right? Seed URIs, and then you typically say, and from that page, follow links three generations deep or so. And that's why at the very end I said, wh where is the boundary? How do we even know? You know, in this web of objects, and I'm interested in this one object that is part of an entire network of objects using web crawling kind of techniques, I can go in and I can start following links. But how do I even know where I have to stop? 
Again, what is an intrinsic part of that web-based scholarly object and what is not? Not very different to the problem I described with the splash page, right? So where is the stuff that really relates to the article described on the splash page? And where is the stuff that totally has no relationship with it at all? And again, I think that with that regard, machine-readable descriptions of what this thing actually consists of could help. Okay. Um, I just have to say, although, Herbert, you don't style yourself as a futurist, I think you've given us a great vision. So thank you very much.